Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> I'm James Williams, Dean of the Seidman College of Business. And on behalf of President Haas, Provost Davis, faculty, staff, students, and alumni of Grand Valley State University and the Seidman College of Business, we welcome you again this morning. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your support over the years, and we know we have a great breakfast session for you this morning. We, before I get started, what I'd like to simply do is recognize, first of all, and acknowledge our president, President Haas. <laughs> then I'd like to thank Rick Baker, who is president and CEO of the Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce, for agreeing to introduce our speaker this morning. We think it's right, we think it's right and quite appropriate that we ask Rick to do this because of the work that Rick does here in a similar capacity. What he's done in his year and a half here at, in Grand Rapids has been tremendous. And we really appreciate our partnership with the Grand Rapids Area Chamber of Commerce in the form of the Family Business Alliance. I know many of you are familiar with the Family Business Alliance, and we thank you for supporting that effort as well, and we ask you to continue to do so, please. They're doing a great job and a great work. So with that, I'd like to ask Rick Baker to come up uh, and introduce our speaker, please. Let's thank Rick. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Dean. Uh, it's my pleasure today to introduce our speaker because he's uh, not just a good colleague in business, but also becoming a very good friend as well. Sandy Baruja is the president and CEO of the Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce, one of the largest chambers of commerce in the United States. I've long admired the work of the Detroit Chamber uh, prior to even coming to, to Michigan uh, and the size of the organization and the work that they do. On a personal note, uh, Sandy was quick to reach out to me when I came to Grand Rapids a year and a half ago and offer his assistance and make sure that um, I hit the ground running quickly here in Michigan and said he would like to help me be successful in my career here in Michigan because our partnership between our two communities is critical to the future of our state. And so, Sandy, I appreciate that um, early reach out. Prior to coming to the Detroit Chamber, Sandy had a long um, distinguished career in Washington, D.C., serving under the, in the administrations of both Presidents Bush, uh, serving as the administrator for the Small Business Administration, um, Assistant Secretary of Commerce, led the Economic Development Administration and a number of other roles. Prior to his uh, time in Washington, D.C., Sandy served as a corporate mergers and acquisitions consultant for a performance consulting group. He's a graduate of University of Oregon, and I know he's also very humble, and so um, someone here in this audience gave me a copy of a magazine in which Sandy's the feature of this magazine, talking about the important role that Detroit plays within the United States economy and here in Michigan and um, the important role that he and the Detroit Regional Chamber play in helping move um, that community forward. And so it is my honor to introduce to you the President and CEO of the Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce, Sandy Baruja. I'm so glad I bought drinks for Rick last night. That worked out really well. Well, good morning, everyone. Rick, uh, thank you so much for that very generous introduction, but more importantly, thank you for your friendship, thank you for your leadership, and thank you for your partnership. I think the two of us, being relatively new Michiganders, uh, I think have been able to accelerate the One Michigan concept that our governor talks about, and I just love it that when our organizations work together, it truly is uh, One Michigan. I also want to thank uh, President Haas, and I want to thank Dean Williams and everyone from Grand Valley to, for inviting me here today. I'm honored to be here, and I'm surprised that at this hour in the morning, there's so many people who are actually fully dressed and fully awake. So that's, that is excellent. And of course, Ambassador Sekia, thank you for honoring us all with your presence. Thank you for everything that you do for our state, for this community, and thank you for your service to our country. So thank you very much, Ambassador. And you may want to check this out. There's apparently in a building across the street with your name on it. I, I check that out. You may, want to, you may want to go in there and see what, see what they're doing in there. I have a special place in my heart for Grand Rapids. And in fact, prior to moving to Michigan in 2010, 
I had never spent more than two consecutive nights in Michigan, and most of my visits to, uh, to Michigan were right here in Grand Rapids. And my second reason for loving Grand Rapids, and actually this is something that Ambassador Sekia knows, is that my inspiration for getting involved in politics, what led to a career for, uh, with one U.S. Senator and two U.S. Presidents, was Gerald Ford. Now, most people my age look to Ronald Reagan as their hero, and I certainly adore and admire Ronald Reagan. But it was actually Vice President Ford who inspired then a fourth grader to get involved in politics. And so after, you know, this a long career that I've had in politics and in government and the various roles that I've held, I always hark back to the principles, the standard, the civility that Gerald Ford represented his entire career. And I can think of no better theme and ambassador for this great community and this great state than President Gerald Ford. And it is actually this experience that was born out of my initial love for politics and government, born uh, by Gerald Ford, my 30 years in various government service, that is actually going to shape my remarks today. So after having worked in Washington for several years, and after the world's shortest stint on a transition team, I was on the Romney transition team, which abruptly ended a couple of Wednesday, uh, Tuesdays ago. I, had, I was originally supposed to fly back for this event from Washington. It turned out to be not necessary. Thank you. I want to depart a little bit from the speech that you might be expecting today as someone who represents uh, the Detroit region and the Detroit Regional Chamber. Because when I look at our nation from my previous roles, when I look at our nation from this wonderful perch that I'm honored to hold in Detroit, I see our society changing. I see our society changing. I see how business interacts with society changing. And we, as corporate leaders, we as citizens of this nation, need to react to these changes in a very fundamental way. So there's three things I want to do in our time together this morning. First of all, I want to talk about the concept of corporate citizenship in the 21st century global marketplace and how that is changing. Secondly, I want to talk about how our role as citizens of this great nation is changing, and how our role as citizens is actually impacting our political debate in our nation. And third, I do want to close on some themes surrounded around Michigan and how and where the state is going. So first of all, let's talk about corporate citizenship. The old definition, or the definition that most of us would come up with when we think of corporate citizenship, I think is at serious risk. The old definition of corporate citizenship boils down to something like this. Corporations make money, and then in order to be view, viewed as a good corporate citizen, they give some of that money to a societal need. They do this for various reasons. They do this to be viewed as a member of the community. Sometimes it's out of, born out of guilt for polluting the environment or making a terrible product. But by and large, most companies, by far, do this corporate citizenship because they, too, are members of the community. They, too, care deeply about the future of the community and the children that will grow up and be the leaders of our community. But that definition, I think, is at risk. And here's why. I think there are four problems with our existing view of corporate citizenship. First of all, there are fewer larger companies today than there have been in the past. Through consolidations, through mergers, through global competition, we now have fewer companies, therefore fewer deep pockets to access to address societal needs. Just think of the number of banks that existed or the number of airlines that existed just a generation ago compared to today. Second. All of you are in business. Many of you are on your way to business, and you know this better than anyone else. Profit margins 
are shrinking, thinner than ever before. And in industries with generous profit margins are immediately swamped with new competition, therefore diminishing those excess profit margins. The global nature of business today, global competition, global footprint, means that companies have more communities to serve, and that's actually a good thing, and even more scarce resources to spread among a more diverse and, frankly, growing societal needs. And let's face it, right now, with the continuing effects of the Great Recession, we have more societal needs in this nation than we have had since the Great Depression. Third, top CEOs have less of a connection to their communities than ever before. Gone, generally, are the days when the CEO was someone who grew up in the region, spent his or her career at the company that they now lead, and are still there. Today's CEOs are more like hired guns. It's not a pejorative statement. It just kind of is the reality of today. And they generally don't have the long ties to their communities that they've had before. This makes people like Bill Ford or the late Hank Meyer or the DeVosses all the more unique and special. But we as a society can't count on that going forward. Let's take a look at my hometown of Detroit. The heads of the top three auto companies headquartered in Detroit, other than Bill Ford as executive chair of Ford, but you look at Alan Mulally, you look at Sergio Marchionne, and you look at Dan Ackerson, none of them are from the region. Doesn't mean they don't care about the region, but let's face it, you compare a Bill Ford's commitment to Michigan to, say, Dan Ackerson's commitment to Michigan, they both care, but one is truly invested, one is here. Fourth and finally, the CEOs and the companies they run have far less flexibility to make discretionary decisions than they have ever had. It wasn't that long ago that Henry Ford II just decided, with a handful of other leaders, to build the Renaissance Center in downtown Detroit. Today, such a decision would be subject to the approval of a more engaged board of directors, thanks to our friends at Enron and the subs subsequent Sarbanes-Oxley Act. And with their eyes on the bottom line, in a much more competitive global marketplace, and of course, the media scrutiny would be far more intense. So in light of all of these challenges and the modern economics, what is the future for corporate citizenship in our nation? So first of all, I think there is hope. I think there's tremendous hope, but it's going to change fundamentally. The first way it's going to change is through the very act of transparency. Andy Warhol famously said that everyone would get their 15 minutes of fame. In today's social media world, it's really more likely that today you're more likely to be able to enjoy your 15 minutes of privacy. There really is no way to keep much that happens, especially in the business world, secret. We see that all the time. If you are a bad actor, or perhaps just as bad, a non-actor in your community, the world will soon find out. Those who do not do the right thing, those who do not contribute back to the society that allows them to function and to make profits and to succeed, the eye of Big Brother, which by the way is now a well-placed blogger, will soon find out and your secret will be in the Grand Rapids Press or the Judge Report the next morning. We have just scratched the surface in terms of how our society will change with the information technology revolution. In the big scheme of things, we are in Information Technology Society 1.1. We have a long way to go. The second reason that gives me hope is actually the capitalistic system itself. I actually think that the capitalistic system is actually going to save the capitalistic system. Here's what I mean. Many of you are familiar with a Harvard professor Michael Porter. Many of you though, who are still in school are probably reading a lot of Michael's groundbreaking work on competition, on industry clusters, on health care. But Michael has now turned his attention to what is loosely called corporate citizenship. 
Now, his, con his context or his concept sounds simple, but I once had a graduate school professor that told me that if I think I understand comparative advantage, I wasn't paying attention, this falls under the same category. Michael Porter calls his concept creating shared value. And creating shared value is the concept of taking the principles of capitalism but intertwining it with addressing social needs. If the old model was here, I'm a business guy, I made money, I'm going to set aside some of this money to give to the community or to a good cause to create some societal good, creating shared value intertwines both of those streams of thought and both of those values into a single value chain. The old model of corporate citizenship or corporate responsibility was really pitting business against society because for every dollar that business gave back to society, it was a loss to the business, and every dollar that wasn't given to society was a loss to society. It was a zero-sum game. And the major difference between corporate responsibility is that it was about responsibility, whereas, well, creating shared value is about, well, creating value for everyone. Here's an example. A rural or impoverished area is in need of basic services, water, telecommunications, farming uh, equipment. What is the product, what is the service that can be created by a for-profit entity at a sufficiently low cost that allows those persons who need that assistance to engage in a productive activity that generates enough revenue to provide a return to the company? A societal need is addressed, but in a way that actually generates profits to a for-profit concern. Some of you have been reading about social impact bonds, which I'm completely fascinated by. Social impact bonds started in Great Britain and are now being uh, used in New York City, and they work a little bit like this. Private money is raised, a bond, and those monies are used to execute a social service project. An example would be drop training for the homeless or programs to keep criminals from repeating their offenses. Those programs executed through government entities th theoretically should have an impact. In the homeless situation, you have fewer needs uh, that the government has to, to meet for housing particular uh, homeless people. If they're successful, not only do they no longer incur the expense of housing the homeless person, but you can get them onto the tax rolls and they're creating a benefit. Under the social impact bond model, those savings go only in part back to the government. The rest of those savings go back to the private investors who created the program. So you're now creating a commercial financial incentive to invest in a program that creates a societal need. So you're addressing multiple problems. You're creating a tool that allows profits to be made, which is good for society. You're also addressing a societal need, and you're actually creating more opportunities for more programs and more money to come in to address a societal need. Some of you have seen General Electric's Echo Imagination campaign. That is a form of creating shared value. Yes, they're advertising it. Yes, they're getting a return on these new socially responsible, you know, environmentally friendly products that General Electric is creating. Lower carbon footprint, lower energy consumption, you know, lower use of natural resources, all good things, but they're also adding to the bottom line. So I'm not giving Michael Porter's concept full uh, you know, full, full discussion here, uh, and I'm not doing it quite justice. But what I'm trying to communicate is that the pressures in today's global corporate community, we're no longer going to be able to employ the old model of transfer payments between business and society to meet our societal needs, especially at a time when governments at all levels in all parts of the world are strapped for resources. So we have societal needs increasing and we have government's ability to address them decreasing 
And with profit margins, with businesses slimming down, you do the math. We need to come up with a different model to address some of these societal needs. And on a related issue, it creates a real challenge for nonprofit organizations, the ones that Rick and myself and Jared Rodriguez run. It's just going to create a real challenge for organizations like ours over time because we have to ask the question as a nonprofit what is the shared value that we are creating? Especially for organizations like, say, Chambers of Commerce or unions for that matter that are in the business of organizing people to take collective action. Because we now live in a world where the cost of organizing has dropped to zero. Look at the Arab Spring. Governments were toppled. And what were the tools used for that? It wasn't guns. There was no organization. There was no leader. There was really no master plan. The Arab Spring was conducted by a bunch of 20 and 30 year olds armed with smartphones and apps. So what does that mean for a chamber of commerce? What does it mean for a union whose job is to organize others to take collective action? So we who are those are the recipients of either government funds to do a social good or business funds to do a, a societal good. What is the shared value that we're creating through our work? So, moving on to individual citizenship, because I think these are two are very linked. This definition of corporate citizenship, I'm convinced, is going to change dramatically over the next generation. Individual citizenship, I think, has already changed dramatically, and perhaps not for the better. To look at where individual citizenship is in this great country. Let's look at Congress. When you look at Congress, what do you see? You see division. You see distrust. You see a lot of screaming and yelling. And we, as citizens, we point to them and we say, ah, our leaders, they are our problem. The truth is, they are not the root of our problem. But I'll tell you who is. I am. And you are. Our leaders are perfectly rational creatures. Just like any company selling a product, they are responding to market forces. Our leaders in Washington, and Lansing for that matter, are responding to the market inputs that we provide them. They behave in the way that they do because, believe it or not, it's exactly what we've told them to do. Now, let me outline why I've come to this very odd conclusion. First of all, have you ever wondered why out of the 435 seats in the U.S. House of Representatives, only 60 to 80 are competitive in any given election cycle? And that the stability of the membership of the U.S. House of Representatives in the United States rivals that of the now defunct Soviet Politburo. So we all know about gerrymandering, right? We create these really funny districts, you know, that look like Z's drawn by three-year-olds. And this practice of gerrymandering started, not, not everyone knows this, but the act of gerrymandering actually started with the most noble of noble purposes. It was an extension of the Voting Rights Act of the 1960s. And a desire to ensure that there was appropriate representation of minorities in the U.S. Congress. That's a noble goal. But that same process has been used to draw districts that protect incumbents of all stripes of both parties. And the act of creating certain districts to protect heavily minority district has naturally left the other districts primarily, well, non-minority. And so you have, just based on basic demographic patterns, the minority districts more liberal and the non-minority districts more conservative. So that's why most of our congressional seats are more, are either reliably Republican or reliably Democrat. And we only have 60 to 80 seats on any given election cycle that are really nationally 
that are competitive. That's why November is actually a non-event in a lot of political races. It's the primary that matters. And we now have a system where we've invented a new word in Washington. It's called primaried. Members of Congress are being concerned about being primaried. And the act of being primaried is that if you're a Republican and you're conservative, or a Democrat and a liberal, you're concerned about fending off a challenge in the primary from someone more conservative than you or someone more liberal than you, depending on your party. Because nobody has to worry about the general election. The general election is, in many cases, a foregone conclusion. It's whichever party wins. You know? So that is the reason why we have this extreme left, extreme right, and there's really no one left in the middle. And we all participate in this. And let me tell you how we all participate in this. How many of you here are registered independents? Okay, just a handful. Okay, interesting, interesting. So if you're an independent voter and you're fed up with both parties, understandably so, and you're not participating in the primary process because, well, you can't. They don't let you participate in the primary process. You're actually contributing to the problem unwittingly, not, not, not by design, because you're allowing the extreme right or the extreme left to choose your candidates that you get to choose in the November election. If you make campaign contributions to the candidate of your choice who you may prefer but you feel that, yeah, this person might be too far left or too far right, you know, or simply the lesser of two evils, you know, you're contributing to, to this problem. Uh, if you're an active partisan voter, and by any definition, I would be considered an active partisan voter, and you select the candidate that most represents your ideological beliefs, if you support that candidate as opposed to the candidate that might be able to build a broader coalition once he or she gets to Lansing or to Washington, we're contributing to that problem. And as you discuss political issues with your friends, your family, your colleagues, the strangers that you run into at Starbucks, how do you talk about the candidate or the party that you oppose? Are they bad people? Are they immoral people? Are they criminally negligent, pe negligent people? If that's the language we use as a society, we're immediately pushing our debate to the extremes. Do you hold your preferred candidate to the same standards that you hold the opposition candidate to? And let me give you just two quick, ex quick examples. If you're a supporter of President Barack Obama, did you defend him when we had those tragic deaths in Libya, which for the record I think is a perfectly appropriate thing to do, but did you criticize President George W. Bush when Americans were killed on his watch? Did you hold both to the same standard or did you hold them to different standards because you supported one and not the other? I do this with my Republican friends who criticize President Obama when he takes vacation. And I said, well, I don't recall you criticizing President Bush when he took vacations. So why is it different for President Obama than it is for President Bush? And so why has this occurred? Why do we go to extremes in our discussion and our debate? And my thought on this is that we now have the ability to tailor our news exactly to our liking. We access news today as a society the same way we order coffee at the Starbucks down the hall. Grande, latte, half-calf, no whip. We get exactly what we want. If you are a conservative, you watch Fox News, you listen to Rush Limbaugh, and you read the Drudge Report online. If you're a liberal, you watch MSNBC News. You listen to Rachel Maddow, and you read the Huffington Post once you get to the office. You can, and most of us do, can go through the entire day accessing news that is tailored to our beliefs. And studies show that if you spend time with people of your similar beliefs day after day after day, your positions will naturally gravitate outward from center. 
because everyone is kind of egging everyone on to take an extreme position. I'm old enough, I'm 46 years old, to remember the time when we had the shared national experience on a daily basis. We got our news from Walter Cronkite or John Chancellor. We went home and we watched I Love Lucy or MASH, and we read either Time or Newsweek. And the next day we talked about what we saw on TV or the news that we read. We experienced the same thing day after day. Today, you don't experience the same thing. We have so many options. I'm not saying it's a bad thing for our society, but we need to realize what we're doing to ourselves here. We had the same news, and the critical difference was is that the fact set was the same. Today, not only do we have our own opinions, as we should, we have our own facts. The fact set is now tailored to our opinions. And today we have columnists or partisans masquerading as news people. Sean Hannity on Fox. He's not a reporter trying to give you a balanced perspective on the news today. Chris Matthews on MSNBC. He's not playing it down the middle. And they look like news sets. They have the same graphics. They've got the same you know, anchor chairs and everything like that. But is that really news? And if we say that we're getting our news from Fox or MSNBC, is it truly, truly news? So the reason I raise this is because our country has huge challenges. Our state has huge challenges. And we can only solve these challenges if, we can, if we're able to talk to each other. And that is an art, that is a skill that our nation is losing. And as we lose it as citizens, we empower our leaders in Washington to also lose it because we're holding them to a different standard. It used to be, when I first got involved in politics with a U.S. senator named Bob Packwood out of Oregon in the 1980s, you would run your campaigns based on what you got done, your ability to work to get things done. As I look at campaigns today, no one talks about that. No one talks about getting anything done. Everyone talks about where they are on the positions and how strongly they're going to fight for fill in the blank. That's a challenge. And it's us as voters, us as citizens, that allow that to happen. So how will individuals, how will the corporate community step up to address the challenges in this very complex era that we live in? Well, certainly we need to collectively redefine what it means to win. It can't be win-lose. It needs to be win-win. And frankly, that is a challenge for our great state of Michigan. One of the key challenges that Michigan faces is that we do have a bit of a win-lose mentality in the state. Far less so here in Grand Rapids on the west side of the state, but as a state as a whole, we have this challenge. Think of this. The industry that made us great and the industry that I'm convinced will continue to make us great, the auto industry, has solidified the win-lose mentality in the state of Michigan. Every Chrysler sold means one less Chevy sold. Every union victory is one less management victory. And certainly, the story in Michigan of city versus suburb, black versus white, county versus county, and yes, the old east versus west, continue to haunt us because we found more ways to slice and dice ourselves than we really should. Our challenge in Michigan, fortunately, is equal to our amazing assets. And we have both an ample supply. Our assets in Michigan are perhaps greater than ever before, and I think are the envy of our state. I mean, envy of our nation. And we have so much to build on if we can crack this code of both corporate and individual citizenship. We have a governor that is refreshingly results-oriented and non-political. He has demonstrated more tangible progress in a shorter period of time than just about any other executive leader I've, in, I've encountered. We have an immense network of higher education in this state that is practically unrivaled in the nation. Not only is Michigan the home 
the creator of the automobile. It is home to some of the best known and most revered brands in the world. Dow, Herman Miller, Kellogg, Domino's, Ford, and the list goes on. And speaking of the automobile, it is perhaps the best platform for economic diversification I can possibly imagine. Advanced composite materials, advanced consumer electronics, complex IT integration, modern transportation distribution and logistics systems, and alternate propulsion systems. If that doesn't make the economy of the 21st century tick, I don't know what does. Michigan is the home of mar modern marketing, and our creative culture was born from this early pioneering work born out of the auto industry. We are leaders in agriculture, tourism, medical technology, and delivery. We are blessed with an ideal position on the globe for international commerce and with low risk of adverse weather. In the last election, Michigan turned away a well-funded set of challenges that would have turned black the clock on this state to a bygone era where big unions and big government were the elixir of all ills. We dodged a serious bullet. And for people like Rick and I, whose job is to attract capital investment into this state, and Birgit Close, who does one of the best jobs in the state of running the right place and the best economic development organization in this state, the election night results were a huge, huge victory for people like us. We have, in short, some of the best set of assets that anyone could possibly ask for. And I'm pleased to say that we are operating as one Michigan, perhaps more than ever before. The collaboration and partnership between East and West Michigan is not only real, it is genuine, and it is productive. And I think we're starting to realize that the differences between the East and the West, Mich uh, West parts of our state actually make us stronger. And certainly, it is not unique to have a state that has multiple cultures in one state. I'm from the West Coast. You can't think of any two more different planets than San Francisco and Los Angeles. But they're still part of one state, strange as it is. West Michigan is loved, and I am completely enamored by the assets that Michigan has, its sense of purpose, its strong civic engagement. East Michigan has this colorful cultural history. But like a family, we have more that unites us than divides us. But our differences actually help strengthen us. And we have so much to learn from each other, and we can't succeed without each other. For my part, from someone from the east side of the state, I am so envious of the strength of your institutions in West Michigan and here in Grand Rapids. I mentioned the right place, the strongest economic development entity in the state. I admire their work. I admire their leadership. Your chamber and the West Michigan Policy Forum are making a real positive difference in the state and are led by outstanding professionals who are actually moving the needle. I am envious of how the business community sets the agenda in West Michigan and knows how to get things done and the unity of purpose of your civic and community leaders. And I admire how you have successfully transformed downtown Grand Rapids into a destination place. I really salute Grand Rapids and my friends in West Michigan. And by working together, the entire state of Michigan can learn from this example. And if we can crack this code of what it means to be a good citizen and the 21st century global marketplace, we will own the next century as Michiganders. You know, because every time that our nation has faced challenges, you know, in World War, in World War II, we won the war. In peacetime, we won the peace. And after the crisis of confidence, after Watergate and Vietnam, we found our confidence again. And after every challenge, this nation has been better off. And Michigan has endured as well. Our governor is fond of saying that Michigan has reinvented itself numerous times. And currently, we're working on Michigan 3.0. And after every transition, Michigan also has been better off. So we have a lot of work to do as corporate leaders. We have a lot of work to do as individual citizens. And if we can crack this code of what it means to be a good corporate citizen and good individual citizens, building on the assets of this state, I am so incredibly optimistic and so honored and thrilled to be part of this new Michigan 
because I can't think of any place that's more exciting and more promising than right here in Michigan. So thank you very much for indulging me this morning, allowing me to stray a little bit from my initial presentation, but most importantly, thank you for spending a bit of your time with me this morning. I'm honored by your presence. Thank you very much. So President Haas said I could charge for questions. Um, so uh, someone will tell me when, uh, uh, when everyone has to go here. Uh, but I'm, I'm happy to take questions if, if there are any, and I'm happy to make up the best answers I possibly can. The tough ones are going to go to Ambassador Sekia, just so you know. Yeah. Okay, uh, uh, I'll be honest, I'm not quite sure I got the question there, but uh, let me try. Yeah, so, so let, 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 right, let, let, me, let me try to answer it, and then, then, then you'll tell me where I'm wrong. Uh, so uh, I'm married, so I'm used to it. Uh, the, um, so profit margins generally in all industries are shrinking. That doesn't mean that companies necessarily are any smaller or less profitable because the volume is greater because of mergers through consolidations, right? Now, on the issue of the repatriation of funds, we do this really odd thing in this nation, which most countries don't do, is that we charge you, you, you okay, so you're the Ford Motor Company and you make profits, say, in England, and, oh, well, bad example because the European market is so bad, but let's say, that, let's say the European auto market was actually healthy right now, and they had excess profits like they did in, 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 pre, in previous decades. They pay taxes in Britain as a local company, as they should, right? But then to bring that money back to invest in the United States, should they want to do that as a global concern, we charge them to do that. Uh, and that, to me, is some, one of the most boneheaded uh, U.S. tax policies I can possibly imagine. We're charging you to bring back your money to your home country. And the argument is, is that, oh, well, you know, we haven't taxed this money yet, and if you bring the money back, you might give it to your shareholders. <gasps> Gasp at the thought. Distributing profits? Oh, my goodness, why would you possibly do it? And, of course, the U.S. shareholders, when you buy a Ford in stock, you only are buying Ford stock only to invest in the United States. You don't want Ford to take that, that money that you've helped capitalize Ford Motor Company with and do anything in Brazil or China or, or Indonesia. You want them to keep it right here. In, you know, of course, that doesn't make any sense at all. So you know, I don't know if I answered that question, but you know, you know, margins are thinner. There's no question margins are thinner, but there's fewer companies, so they're bigger. The volume is greater. They're making a lot of money, but they've got a lot more communities to serve. And on the repeat trade fund, which I think is a slightly different issue, uh, we have the dumbest policy on the planet. And I haven't been drinking yet this morning. I mean, this is great. Way in the back. Come from what businesses? Family oh, family. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'll be honest with you. No, not really. Uh, one, you know, the family-owned business. Uh, you know, first of all, you know, I love the West Michigan view of what a family-owned business is. 
you know, it's what the Secchias have done. It's what the DeVosses have done. That's my kind of family-owned business. Uh, in other parts of, you know, you know, the state and, and the world, frankly, you, know, you think of family-owned businesses, you're thinking about smaller businesses. I mean, these are big, major companies that, are, that have do a tremendous amount of good. I think one of, the, one of the greatest assets that West Michigan has is the intense commitment by major family-owned businesses. Even those that are now publicly traded, they're still family-controlled. And that is a huge, huge benefit. I mean, I even look, I mean, just, you know, Ford, you know, I, I keep using Ford as an example. Just having Bill Ford at the head of Ford as executive chair, even though he's not, you know, day-to-day -day CEO, is a huge benefit to me as a Detroit Regional Chamber. Uh, but uh, to answer your question, I don't have, we do not have a specific program uh, to, you know, to, uh, to encourage family-owned businesses uh, on a uh, Lansing legislative policy agenda, uh, we would work very closely with you know your economic development organizations here, the Right Place, the Chamber, uh, the, the Policy Forum, along with business leaders from Michigan, which we're very close to uh, the state chamber on you know what policy is. I mean, there is a much more unified business agenda in this state than there was even two years ago before I came, uh, and it's just. It, 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 it's, it's, you know, again, there's very little daylight between the major business groups across the state. Yes, sir, right here. Thank you. I have to use three? Um, okay, one. Uh, the, you know, having Dave Bing as the mayor of the city of Detroit is a huge step forward for the city. Uh, not perfect. Uh, you know, he's certainly got his challenges. But compared to where the city was prior to a Dave Bing administration, uh, hugely, hugely helpful. Uh, one, we have a mayor that hasn't gone to jail yet. I mean, this is this is this is big. I mean, you know, you know, help us celebrate our successes, please. I mean, come on. Uh, he is honest as the day is long. He's the hardest working man I have ever met. Uh, he has only the best uh, of intentions. Uh, the second is the fact that we, you know, it's a little bit like only Nixon can go to China. We have a Republican governor who is absolutely committed to urban areas in the city, I mean, in the state. And that is hugely important because, uh, and I say this, so, you know, uh, you know, everyone knows that, you know, the city of Detroit has its challenges, but everyone also knows, especially if you live in Michigan, that some of the best neighborhoods on the planet are right outside Detroit. I've never lived any place with such exquisite neighborhoods, and I've lived in some great cities in my life. Nobody who's graduating here from Grand Valley or the University of Michigan or Wayne State is saying, hey, I want to move to Birmingham, Washington or Bethesda, Maryland or Westchester County, New York or Gross Point, Michigan. They say, I want to move to Seattle. I want to move to Washington, D.C. I want to move uh, to Portland, Oregon. I want to move to Detroit. They want to move to cities. And this governor gets that. So that's my second, my second one. The third one is what I mentioned in my remarks, that we had a change election. We had an election that changed not necessarily, I mean, we set, kept the table the same, we kept the status quo, but what we did do is we didn't turn the clock back. And that's a huge, huge victory. So those are the three things that I can think of. You guys are standing up, so that means my time is probably done. One more question. Yes, right here. Uh, well, uh, the first question, uh, D uh, Detroit, uh, we, we have not. Uh, so social impact bonds are uh, probably for a city that is farther along in its development than Detroit is. Um, you know, that's a little bit like, you know, uh, I, I'm trying to think of a great analogy, but I can't think of one. So that's a little bit, that's more of, 
that's kind of a graduate level course. We're still kind of in, you know, uh, uh, sophomore level citizenship right now in, in, in Detroit. So give, give, it, give us time to get there, but we're, we're not there yet. Uh, parking meters, I have no opinion on parking meters at all, although I will say that I do pay them most of the time. <laughs> all right. Well, I think with that, thank you all very much. You've been very generous with your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Appreciate you it. Stay right here. Okay. I'll stay right here. Well, I have a chance to... Uh wrap this up. Uh, first off, uh, thank you, Rick, for being here and being a great leader in our community. Uh, Ambassador Sekiyad, uh I think uh, we had a little sidebar there. One of the uh, most uh, intellectually uh, founded uh, conversations we've had during this uh, series and uh, focused, uh, I think, uh, very clearly on the multiple uh, audiences we have here. We have the business community. We also have uh, the future leaders with our students that are here as well. And to uh, kind of paint the picture that uh, uh, is, is very uh, interesting because of the paradox that uh, you have uh, uh, given us to think about. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the sides, so to speak, and how you come together. Uh, you know, when we think about the mittens of Michigan, uh, you don't see any fingers, really. And what you What's do that? see is, uh, is uh, uh, two gloves that uh, hopefully are now working uh, much more together. Uh, East, West, UP or not, uh, we, we've had a chance. I, I met Sandy some years ago up at Mackinac uh, during the uh, Mackinac Island event. And then uh, last summer, we, we chatted a little bit and said, hey, how would you like to come on over to Grand Valley sometime? Here he'd be. Little did we know that a week and a half ago, we were on the on other TV side together, of the state yeah. doing a Detroit Matters uh, show together. And so the uh, connectivity here through the mittens, in my mind, is clear and very, very impactful and very, very strong. And if we continue to uh, take Sandy's uh, sense of optimism that the mittens are, in fact, working together with, with leadership, and then we have the opportunity of telling the leaders in Lansing and telling the leaders in, in D.C., this is the way we want it to be. And we can change that culture as well, yeah. which I do appreciate uh, very much. We do have lots to be thankful for uh, as we wrap up uh, this year, this academic uh, semester. And uh, very, very, uh, I, I agree with Sandy. I, I have a great sense of, uh, of optimism as we move into 2013 and beyond. We have lots of uh, nitty issues uh, to, uh, uh, to, to tackle. But I think, uh, without a doubt, we have uh, the intellectual capability to do just that. So again, thank you for providing those, uh, those thoughts uh, that are very much aligned with, I think, the ambassador's uh, vision of what this uh, series is all about. Can, can, can I just say one, one last thing? Just, uh, uh, let me just take just 60 seconds here on this working together thing. You know, when we think of Michigan you know, and we think of competition, you know, we... We're so used to this east versus west or county versus county. You know, one of the things that I always think of is that, you know, in today's global marketplace, and those of you who are leading businesses get this, you get this at the right place, is that our competition today is not the other side of the state. It's not the county next door. It is anybody on this planet that has a good education, right? Think about that in terms of what that means for Michigan. You know, um, a good idea, right? And a good internet connection. I mean, that's what it takes today. You know? And you know, so if we think about you know, the east side of the state or the west side of the state as our competition, we're really missing the real competition in this global marketplace because, you know, as Tom Friedman said, it rolls pretty flat. So. And then if I could tie that yeah. together with the uh, uh, connectivity, the interdependence, really, of the uh, educational sector and the business sector as well and the policies that we can both influence that make the state better, make the mm -hmm. nation better as well. So uh, that uh, essence, I, I think the, the middle ground has to be driven towards collaboration. Uh, I, I believe that, uh, I like, I'm, I'm a sports guy, I like competition. And when we keep mm -hmm. score, that's great. But at the end of the day, I want to be able to say we've done the best we could for the game. I want to say that the best we've done together is for the state of Michigan and the nation as well. And that's what we have heard, what we have heard here today. Uh, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, offer you uh, a chance to represent. 
uh, as the dean said, uh, we can we can do this. And here's uh, something to share great. with you. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm honored. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. That's great. But thank you all for coming and have a great uh, safe holiday season coming up. And again, we look forward to 2013. I'll turn it over to uh, my friend Bill. Thank you all. God bless. Just a reminder that uh, I represent the Seedman Alumni Association that hosts these breakfasts for you. January 11th is our next health uh, care checkup at Eberhard Center. So we hopefully will see you all there and have a safe holiday and enjoy. Thank you.